Hi, welcome to session six of our Tapestry Teachers Training Series. This one is entitled Tailoring Tapestry to Fit. I'm Marcia Somerville, author of Tapestry of Grace. In this session, my main purpose is to show you how to take tapestry plans and cut and sew them to fit your unique children. You know, often when newcomers first crack open the actual pages of our curriculum, they feel overwhelmed at the sheer volume of material. If this describes your current state, it's important for you to know that tapestry plans offer more suggestions for teaching than any family will need to use. We liken tapestry, therefore, to a bolt of beautifully woven material that still has to be cut and sewn by you in order to fit each child in your family. Or, another common analogy is, you'll hear that tapestry offers you a buffet brimming with educational choices, and you should not attempt to serve all of them to your children each week. Rather, you need to take and choose from the selections that we offer in order to fill your child's educational plate with just the right amount of food for him. Now, some bewildered newcomers would naturally say, but I bought tapestry to tell me what to do. How am I to choose? My goal in this session is to explain why it is that you need to tailor tapestry plans and then go on to show you just how quickly and easily you can do this week to week. Now, this session is not just for newcomers. Tapestry is a rich, deep program with many features. Like many convenience machines of our day, there's always something new to learn, even if you've been using tapestry for years. I hope that many veteran tapestry users will give a lesson to this session. Even if it presents nothing new, it may make a great review of your choices when tailoring tapestry to fit your kids. Now, in order to explain to newcomers why you need to tailor tapestry, I need to start with a bit of background information. Tapestry of Grace was born out of my own personal need. I was literally ready to quit homeschooling in the fall of 1995 when I had six kids in school from grades K through 9. Now, I'd been homeschooling for 10 years at that point, and my husband Scott was a lawyer who worked for Homeschool Legal Defense Association. So it kind of surprised him when one memorable October night I met him at the door as he came home from work with a kiss and these words, Honey, here's where we stop homeschooling. Now, I was serious, ladies. I wasn't just down in the dumps and I wasn't making a play for sympathy. You see, I'd had the privilege of being classically educated at one of the finest prep schools in the country during my high school years, and then I'd gone on to an Ivy League college. I had been looking forward for 10 years to teaching the high school years to my kids because my own experience of those years had been so rich. In my prep school, I had been introduced to the Great Conversation, which is the series of authors who have had the most influence on the thought life of humanity down through the ages. I'd been introduced to them through excellent teachers, five of them per year, who would help me learn to analyze them and to come to my own conclusions about what I thought of these authors. Up until that October night in 1995, I had believed that I would be able, on my own, to recreate my own experience in high school for my kids, and had worked hard to make my dream a reality. I was a generally organized, diligent mother who had 10 years of teaching experience under my belt, and my outlook was, if anything, overconfident about my abilities to tackle almost anything that I set my mind to. But the last six weeks of school in 1995 had opened my eyes to my inability to teach my high schoolers to the same high standards that I'd enjoyed as a high schooler. Unlike my teachers at my prep school, I had other good priorities, such as teaching my littles. Remember, I had a non-reading kindergartner, two other grammar students, and one dialectic level child at the same time. I also had, of course, housekeeping responsibilities, meals to cook, church involvement, and... To my real dismay, I was finding that I simply could not teach my high school-aged boys the same way that I had been taught in prep school. Go figure. So, instead of teaching them the way I had always dreamed of teaching them, I found myself handing my two older boys great works of literature along with the Cliffs Notes on them. I'd say, here, read the Cliffs Notes for each chapter, and then read the chapter. It's a rite of passage. I hope you get it. Good luck. And then I walked off into the field the next ball that bounced into my court. So as those first six weeks of fall unfolded in 1995, I knew that something was really wrong with homeschooling for the very first time. To put it in a nutshell, I knew what a good education should look like, and this was not it. Hence my declaration at the door to Scott. This is where we stop homeschooling. Now Scott is always a self-controlled man, and his response was measured. 
He did mention that his job as a homeschooling lawyer for HSLDA would probably end if we stopped homeschooling. Well, that may be, but I'm not about to sacrifice the educations of my kids on the altar of your job. Phew, poor guy. Now, you've probably guessed by now that we didn't stop homeschooling. Scott's loving leadership was that we needed to pray this decision through, ask for counsel, and research the alternatives. Meanwhile, I had to keep going with the textbook-oriented programs that I'd planned during the summer before. The next few weeks were really tough. I cried a lot, prayed hard, and talked to as many older women as I could about how they had done homeschool high school. Because of Scott's job, I was privileged to know personally such godly women as Vicki Ferris and Elizabeth Smith. Vicky's advice was to find what I could teach and find classes outside the home for the rest of what I couldn't teach. That made me sad. I didn't want to farm out my kids to others to teach, but it did get me thinking about what my strengths were and where I might let go and let others do a better job than I could do in teaching. Elizabeth Smith filled me with vision for why it's so important to homeschool through high school. She wasn't that focused on academics, though her two children had done well in colleges. She was all about discipleship and parenting in the high school years. Through her care, I received a God-oriented perspective that I relate in Session 3 of this Tapestry Teacher Training Series entitled Gaining a Vision for Homeschooling High School. Many thoughts in that session originally came into my heart and mind through Elizabeth Smith. Another godly lady in our church, Kathy, said to me one night almost in passing, You know, you don't need to teach every subject every day. I remembered then that in traditional high schools, kids generally have three or perhaps four classes in the major subjects per week. They can double up on independent assignments, and then you can lecture once or twice a week on that subject. Some, like the hard sciences and math, may need more, but for the humanities, you could get by with one class a week. That was a thunderously new concept to me. I'd spent years doing every subject every day. I'd been planning, implementing, correcting, and reteaching where necessary five major subjects times six kids, 30 core lessons, plus electives, and all from an age-graded curriculum that were designed primarily for traditional school settings. When you look at it that way, no wonder I couldn't do it all. Functionally, it was Vicki's comment about teaching my strengths that set me into the path of arranging all the humanities studies, which constituted my strengths, around the core of history studies. It was my history classes at prep school that had most fired my imagination as a high schooler. In fact, I was so deeply influenced by one history teacher at prep school that, when I went to Dartmouth College, history became my major. Now I wanted for my kids to experience the same thrill when studying history, so I wasn't going to give that topic up. As a Christian homeschooling parent, I also realized that history studies would be the main means of developing my kids' worldviews. I knew that my burning desire in teaching my older kids was to equip them with the ability to answer those who would seek to undermine their faith with clever arguments or opposing beliefs once they left the home. All of the events and beliefs in human history were grist for the mill because it was during these crucial high school years that my kids would need to answer for themselves crucial questions like, who is God to me? Is he my God or my parents' God? And what do I believe about him and his character? Tracing God's hand and knowing his heart were the two most important elements that I had to get across to them. When it got down to it, Elizabeth Smith was right. Everything else was window dressing as far as I was concerned. Thus did God gradually put the pieces together for me. I saw that history was a hat rack on which I could hang all of the needed high school studies in the humanities. I was strong in history, and I was determined that I would teach that and farm out the math and sciences where I was weak. Once I made the decision to organize our studies chronologically, I realized that by using a unit study approach, I could easily plan lesser related subjects that tied into the historical eras at hand. I thus connected geography, art history, all our crafts, literature, some major developments in the history of science, and a concentrated focus on church history to the historical studies. All of these were naturally interrelated, and I researched enough to set them in the historical context each week. Then, departing from a textbook approach entirely and embracing unit study using whole books, I used the library and homeschooling catalogs to find resources for all of my kids. The finishing piece of the puzzle was to realize that I could put all of the children, studying at their own levels, on the same basic humanities topics each week. 
putting all the kids on the same basic related weekly topics and thus unifying the whole family on the self-same study restored my sanity and made learning more interesting for the kids and an added and extra unexpected bonus was it unified us as a family. Suddenly, Dinner with Dad was a time when everyone was sharing their individual insights, fun facts, and experiences with the same basic content. It was exhilarating for all of us. Now, in those first few months, I wrote my lesson plans on spare pieces of paper, napkins, and the whiteboard, thinking that I little needed to keep any records of what I was doing. I was working for my own kids, attempting to use the grace and provision of God for me in my life to serve them to the best of my ability. And it was working. Our homeschool had new life, and I was actually enjoying teaching again. While life was still demanding, it was doable, and we did not stop homeschooling. Now, fast forward with me about three years. I got very tired of teaching as my boys graduated from high school, and I faced another rotation with my second tier of high schoolers in 98. Since I knew from teaching someone else's child Latin that I gained an added boost when teaching children of others, I decided to build in some accountability for myself in 98 for the upcoming school year by forming a co-op. I offered to teach the history and had the other eight moms rotate teaching the literature. We met twice a week. These eight families, and more who joined every year, then went through a four-year history cycle, and I weekly wrote out our lesson plans. It was during these years that Tapestry of Grace formally came into being and was honed, expanded, formatted, and a total surprise to me at the time, eventually sold over the internet as classic Tapestry of Grace. Fast forward again to 2010. Through many amazing adventures, here we are today. Tapestry of Grace redesigned is finished and is the result of 10 years of field testing, writing, proofing, and rewriting with what has become over the years a local co-op involving 70 students. Added to these has been the feedback of thousands of families that are using it throughout the world. I am humbled and amazed to see where God has taken me and our family as we were simply trying to faithfully walk out our homeschooling vision to His glory. Now, why did I tell you that story? Well, first of all, I wanted you to know that Tapestry of Grace was initially developed to serve me, a single, busy, homeschooling mom who was desperately trying to give her children a meaty, classic, liberal arts education such as I myself had so enjoyed in high school. My goal in developing this method of teaching and including the content that it suggests was that I wanted to prepare my children for the world by closely scrutinizing with them the worldviews that oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ and thus equipping them to, as the Bible says, understand the times and know what Israel or their churches, or their families, should do. Tapestry has not been developed by a committee of experts in education or a large company with multiple authors and tons of money behind it. In so many ways, Tapestry is simply one beggar, me, telling other beggars where she found bread. Here's how this relates to you. I hope that by emphasizing this point, you'll lose any fear of tweaking Tapestry as it is written and has come to you. Even if it had been written by a team of experts, there's no way that one person or set of people can know your unique children like you do. I want to put courage and faith in your heart to cut and sew tapestry into garments that fit your children. My story relates to you as well because many of us resonate with the same goals. When I began to teach the tapestry approach as one among many of my friends here in Maryland, I felt a bit unique in my educational goals and philosophy. What has so surprised me, as God has led me to write for a larger and larger audience, is that the desires that I had for my kids' education were far from unique. So many women have told me and told our staff at conventions and over the phones that tapestry gives them the means to teach as they've always dreamt of teaching. The idea of a unit study-based classical curriculum delivered with history as its organizing principle over a multi-year rotating schedule is not original with me. What is unique is the combination of these and the book choices we've made and the discussion outlines that we present. My guess is that if you're listening to this, the same educational philosophy resonates with you as well. So we share a dream, but what about implementation? This is what this session is about, the way to make tapestry your own without taking your whole day about it. While your and my goals may be practically identical, no two families are. God has created us unique, with one-of-a-kind minds, hearts, and life experiences, and then he's given us differing numbers of -of one-of-a-kind children. 
Some of you have a house full to teach. Others may have only one child whom you desire to teach excellently. Some families have outside interests such as music, sports, or ranching that limit the time that they can allot to academics. Some moms work out of the home or in their homes each day, as well as teaching their kids. So the question naturally arises, well, I love the dream, but can you put feet to it for me? Can I, in my unique circumstances, use tapestry and prosper? Often, but not always, the answer is, yes, you can. My goal in crafting this session is to teach you how to tailor make our yardage of tapestry cloth into garments that exactly fit each and every one of your children, as well as you, the teacher, to perfection. But it's time for a few more true confessions before I get started showing you the tricks of the tailoring trade. I must confess that before God led me to the tapestry approach, I was a curriculum junkie. My dear husband enabled my addiction. Up until the time that I settled into the tapestry approach, I tried most of the popular curricula of my day and gained experience and improved my teaching in each case. You know, the other curricula were all good in their way. But as with the little bear in the Goldilocks story, none of them was just right. The hopping that I did from program to program served me when I realized that God was leading me to write tapestry for a wider audience than just my family and then a wider audience than just my co-op friends who had the ability to call me if they became confused to those that I would never meet across the nation and the world. First, I was convinced from my own experience in curriculum trial and error that tapestry would need above all to be flexible. It would need to be customizable and easily by busy moms or it would have a very narrow range of service in the homeschool community. Here's my point. Tapestry was purposefully designed to be customized. You are meant to pick and choose. I never, ever intended that any one student would do all of the work suggested by the plans each week. The second thing that I learned from curriculum hopping was that various approaches worked and others didn't. I wrote for you, therefore, what I wished for myself in authoring tapestry. I tried to collect all the best approaches in one place. But I also included some aspects of other curricula that, while they didn't float my boat, were nonetheless clearly useful to many others of my friends. Let me give you a quick, incomplete list of some of the main features that I included from the beginning as a result of my experiences with other programs. First, I knew from the beginning that this was going to be a whole books program. But if I was going to recommend specific books, those books would need to be always available in print, and we would need to find a way to be committed to updating the book lists when books went out of print. Later, in redesigned tapestry volumes, we conceived a way to make our primary book list current on page 4 of each week plan, while listing old favorites that have gone out of print as alternates on page 5. That's how those two pages came to be part of the curriculum. The commitment to whole books ran deep. Rather than use excerpts, summaries, or textbooks at great appropriate levels, I wanted to use whole books wherever possible. While I've been able to stick to this original idea pretty closely, this is one of those areas where later we did add textbooks as alternates on page 5 to our course selections because a large segment of students find them useful as introductory kind of big picture reading that then form a context for the whole books that we recommend as core items. Also, some earlier literature works, especially during the Middle Ages and such, were simply too long or too archaic to include as entire books. However, here's where you can tailor our plans. You can always take more time than we have planned to do entire works in the weeks where we exert them. Now, I determined that the books that we recommended would also not be the only books that could be used to successfully teach the weekly topic. I pictured experienced moms with many homeschooling books on their shelves switching to tapestry, and I didn't want to force them to buy one of, quote, my books just because it was in print or current. Thus, especially for the grammar years, the history and craft books that I choose are interchangeable with books that have a similar content. So if one of my user moms already had a book for grammar students on the life and presidency of Abraham Lincoln, for instance, on her shelf, she should be able to use it and not have to buy the one we list just because it was in print. In classic tapestry, I did this for all four learning levels, but the feedback that we got over time was that when we began at the dialectic level to offer specific questions on independent reading, students had trouble finding the answers when the resource lists were open-ended. You can still choose to use alternate books on your shelf to cover history topics with redesigned tapestry, but you may need to adjust, delete, or rewrite the accountability or thinking questions that we offer. 
those now are specific to the resources that we recommend on the primary page four list of your reading assignment charts. The trade-off here is completely up to you, and it's just another way that you can tailor tapestry to your own needs. Now, early on, another thing that we did in classic tapestry was to list books that could be shared across levels. So, if we had a history resource on Egypt, the dialectics and the rhetorics would read the same book. I did this thinking that moms would save money and that it would promote family unity as well. However, the feedback that we got led us to provide one separate resource for each of our four learning levels. This was partly because some kids, though they were four years older, when they came to reread the same resource, they remembered and objected to reading the one that they'd read during the last rotation. It was also because it was too far a stretch for, for instance, some dialectics to read some rhetoric books, or it was too young for some rhetorics to read the same as dialectic books. So now, Tapestry suggests separate resources for all levels, but let me tell you a secret. If you want to combine resources for levels, especially in the grammar years, you can. We also continue to provide suggestions for cross-level sharing each week in our Glance Ahead. Now another goal for me as a curriculum designer became that I wanted to promote students growing into being independent learners as much as they could at each learning level. This was a benefit both to moms and to students. Moms benefit because when the students can proceed independently, you're freer to do other things. You have more time to spend with the kids who need you the most, your preschoolers or your non-fluent readers. Students benefit because, as they partake in both weekly planning of lessons and the responsibilities to get their work done to set deadlines, they learn crucial time management skills. They plan their own work and work their own plans, and we find that the more that they own their work, the more they delight in it. Now, I had seen this in operation in my own kids, and then I saw it in operation in the kids in our co-op, and I wanted to build it into tapestry from the beginning, so I started to teach it as I started to produce tapestry for a wider audience. At first, moms across the country thought that I meant that kids should make their own choices as to what content they would be studying. This was never it. Moms must not decide lesson contents with tapestry, but managing that content, scheduling it within the days themselves, correcting the work that they do with integrity, keeping track of school supplies, and breaking down weekly tasks that are offered in Tapestry of Grace into daily ones responsibly. These are all life lessons that can begin sooner than many moms realize. And speaking of developing things in our students, one of the most important elements of my own prep school education was that I was taught via Socratic questioning. This ancient method of asking students questions that lead them to form their own conclusions through logical steps is a powerful method for building worldviews that students understand, remember, and own. Not every mom comes into homeschooling knowing how to conduct Socratic discussions, so from the very beginning, I set out to school moms in this skill. The discussion outlines that Tapestry offers are just that, outlines of questions that you can ask with sample answers that a child might achieve given in italics underneath. These discussion times become the key feature of Tapestry studies with older children when they are in the dialectic and rhetoric years. Now session 7 of the Tapestry teacher training series will focus exclusively on this aspect of Tapestry instruction. There's another way that my discussion outlines remain just that, outlines. When writing discussions for moms of dialectic and rhetoric students, I always had in mind women who, being moms of 12 to 18 year old children, have some life experiences behind them. You older moms bring more than you may realize to historical topics you will discuss with older students. You may not know a vandal from a Visigoth when you start a week plan. That's okay. Anyone can look that up, and we've provided factual information like that at your fingertips in our teacher's notes background sections. But there's an element that we can't provide that you bring to your discussion times that's so precious. It's your unique outlook on life, on God, and on the relationships you have with others. These are priceless treasures that personalize and enliven your teaching and make it, well, yours. Don't underestimate yourself as you prepare tapestry lessons. Our outlines leave room for and encourage you to tweak and inject your emphases, your analyses, and your beliefs into the process of Socratic discussion with your children. I count on you, guided by the Holy Spirit, to finish the work that I've only begun as I put the finishing touches on the printed discussion outlines. Alrighty, now perhaps you can begin to see 
the tapestry is not meant to be used out of the box. In order to gain a full measure of the investment that you make in it, you have to choose which of our suggested approaches to each weekly topic your children will undertake. Though it may at first glance seem easier for you if I were to plan each and every aspect of your students' assignments so that you could just point to them on assignment sheets and say, go, I want to give your children the opportunity to gain the very best education that they can have. And I can't convince myself that a point and shoot plan is the best. The time that I'm asking you to customize Tapestry of Grace is not much, one to two hours per week if you're teaching all four levels. And the tweaking time does double duty for you because you're also going to prepare to be well informed and active in your teaching as you're doing the tweaking. You know, homeschooling is tutorial instruction, which is head over heels the most efficient and effective kind of education that there is. But what a shame it would be to adopt the best method of instruction on the planet only to settle for a fully canned curriculum that someone you don't know has dreamed up in some office somewhere. You know and love your child best. Why not take a little extra time and plan the course of study that will surprise and delight him or her? Tapestry's organization makes it extremely easy to simply choose the activities, reading assignments, or topics that are best for each child. This is the essence of tailoring that I'm recommending. It's not that you have to come up with creative or fresh approaches. I've done that for you in more than enough ways. Rather, what you need is a systematic approach to making choices and to understand the kinds of choices that you're making. So let's identify the main reason for the extra cloth in tapestry plans. We'll start with modalities. One reason that there's more than enough to choose from in tapestry week plans is that different children learn differently. Most educators agree that people take in information in three ways which they call modalities. Mode of learning. We can take things in through the eyes, visual learning, through the ears, auditory learning, and through touch or experience, tactile learning. We went over the details of these modalities and how to select them in the Tapestry Teacher Training Session number 2, Lesson Planning 101. If you'd like more information on this, please listen to that session. But for now, let's just say that my desire to offer a variety of modalities is the main reason that there's more than enough to choose from in the tapestry lesson plans. If I had only planned for visual learners, how could I serve those of you with auditory or tactile learners? Obviously, the answer is I couldn't. You need to determine the primary learning modality that best serves your child each week. Then, you can quite easily and confidently match specific students to specific suggestions of approaches to the weekly topic in the tapestry plans. In many cases, you can vary the modality approaches week to week. Many children benefit from a combination of all three approaches. Because you're in a tutoring environment, you can choose, combine, or repeat any of the modalities that I offer. But in the end, the modalities need to be handpicked by you who knows your child best. Hence, one need for you to cut and sew. Another major reason that there's more than enough in tapestry plans is that we're serving children in learning stages, not ages. Again, sessions two and four in the tapestry teacher training sessions dealt with this in detail, but the point that I'm reiterating here is that children learn on different levels at different ages. If we wanted to lockstep learners by age as they do in larger school settings, there would be far less choice involved in tapestry plans. As it is, we present you with a full spectrum of learning opportunities for kids in grades K through 12, so that often a student can be using, say, dialectic literature selections and rhetoric history ones while writing at only the sixth grade level for a season. Students can also move from lower level to higher one easily and from week to week or from unit to unit. This structure gives you amazing support and flexibility as a teacher, but again, it means that you need to cut and sew. And then finally, no two homeschooling families have exactly the same rhythms of life and goals for education. Some families are small, some large. Some rise early while others are night owls. Some families are committed heavily to non-academic pursuits, music, sports, farming, church activities, etc. Some students are college prep and others will finish formal education in high school. What I've tried to do with tapestry is to make it serve well each person who undertakes each piece of it. So while some families may never touch the pageant of philosophy, the government track, or the geography, many families will. Each discipline in tapestry needed to be as complete as it could, so that if you do decide to take up the government elective, there's enough there for you to claim it on your high school transcript. 
If your child does do geography assignments, he actually needs to come out learning something. This desire to be complete and meaty in all disciplines that we offer then adds options and choices that you have to make for your kids. Perhaps your oldest son dreams of becoming a president, while your younger daughter wants to be a ballet dancer and a mother. Your son would take our government elective, but your daughter probably wouldn't. This is your choice, but we need to provide a government elective that's meaty enough for your son, even if you don't choose to use it for your daughter. Can you begin to see my point? You want to serve your children the best educational menu you can, or you just wouldn't be homeschooling in the first place. I share your goal, and I want to empower you to do just that. But there's only so much I can do for you sitting here in Maryland. What I've done is to arrange all the resources that you'll need to do an excellent job here at your fingertips, and then I've asked you to simply choose the best of the best from among them, best meaning best for your individual child, for each individual child in your family. Okay, now I'm going to stop with all the philosophy of education, stories, whys, and wherefores of this session and get down into practical matters. Let's say that you buy the concept that you must cut and sew the tapestry yardage that I'm offering you in order to make educational garments that perfectly fit your kids. The next question I'm hearing in your mind is, how do I do that? So glad you asked. That's what we're covering next. All right, what you see before you now is the DE interface for year two. And it doesn't matter if you're using DE or if you're using a print-only copy. Both of them are the same content, whether they're being delivered by paper and ink or whether by electrons on your screen. So I'm going to use this interface to show you how you go about tailoring different parts of Tapestry of Grace to fit your individual children. So I'm going to use week two of year two in order to give this demonstration. And so I would click into unit one. And then I would go down either here to find week two. If I do this, it will show me all of the add-ons and supplements that go with the curriculum. I can either click on curriculum or I can click on browse the week plan. And once I do, it will come up like this in a new square in Lock Lizard. And here you have all the various points, all the various sections that we use with Tapestry of Grace. You have the thread section, the reading assignments, the weekly overview, the writing assignments, the student activities, pageant of philosophy, teacher's notes, and the glance ahead into next week. And where I always like to start is with the glance ahead from the week before to see what kinds of things I'm going to need to be looking at in this week. But I'm actually going to save my explanation of the glance ahead until the very end of this little session. So instead, we're going to start with the threads. And this right now is the threads. The threads are open. Um, this is the first page of the threads. You'll see there are three pages of threads, the first one, the second one, and the third one. And the threads are here to give you an overview of the various uh, levels, learning levels, and what they're trying to achieve in each week. Your lower grammars are your little non-readers. Um, your upper grammars are your, are your elementary children who are fluent readers and can read to learn. Your dialectic children are around junior high age. They're entering puberty, in puberty, or leaving puberty, as we discuss in our session on teaching dialectic and, and grammar children. And then this is your rhetoric level, which is your high schoolers, basically. And these colors will guide you all the way through the week plan. So one time-saving tip right off the bat is that if all you've got is kids from about grades 4 to 6, you're only going to be looking at this one section as you go to be tailoring tapestry. So right off the bat, the color um, coding that we have <clears throat> in Tapestry of Grace helps you to understand how to tailor tapestry to your needs. If you're new and feeling overwhelmed, be assured that all you have to be looking for is the color that applies to your child's learning level, or you maybe need, need to be looking at the purple, because purple in tapestry inside of charts and graphs and things or at the bottom of the page always means all levels. It applies to all levels. Now, don't be confused with the purple that's at the top of this page. Um, the purple that's at the top of this page is showing you a section. Each of these sections has a different... Uh, color. If you look at reading and weekly overview, those are overview pages, so their color is yellow at the top. If you look at writing assignments, it's always red. If you look at student activity pages, they are all blue. All of them, all of these pages have blue at the top. If you're looking at the pageant of philosophy, it's gray, and if you're looking at the teacher's notes, it's white. And then the glance ahead is white as well because it's um, listed for the teacher's use. So teacher is usually white. So going back to the threads, the purple on threads is because purple at the top of the page stands for introduction. 
And what we're doing here is giving you an introduction. Let's look at the introduction just because it's brief for the lower grammar children. Remember, these are the ones for whom tapestry is the dessert of the week. Learn about the Byzantine Empire and its great, greatest emperor, Justinian I, and learn about early monks of Western Europe. That's the basic goal for this week for these little readers. Now, the um, upper grammar students have a little more goals. The dialectics have slightly different goals, and the rhetorics have slightly different, even more in-depth goals. But it's all about the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern Orthodox Church. So right off the bat, what you have to realize is they're all on the same topic. And what you're looking at as you browse your way through this week plan and your planning time is you're looking at what are the things that are going to be most interesting or most beneficial for my students. Now, as we go down through threads, we're going to find that on the first page, we have the core subjects. I just want to show you that on the first place, we have the core subjects, which is history, and then we consider writing as a core subject, and then we consider literature as a core subject. These are the three core subjects. The reason this says all levels here is because these are really just prompts to tell you to go look in the places where there's more detailed information on writing and on literature. Now, page two of every week, you're going to start with the electives. Electives does mean optional, and we want you to keep it optional if you possibly can. So when you see two learning level colors together, it means that this content applies to both of these levels. So that's another time saver for you. Also note something I didn't put out on the front page, but for every discipline for the geography, here's where you find teacher notes background help. For fine arts and activities, here's where you find teachers background help. For church history, here's where you find it. So all of the disciplines that we go through all have teacher's aids in the back. And then this is the third page. These are the last two electives that are only for rhetoric students, and that's government and philosophy. So these threads are your quick um, overview as you're planning out the week or as you're getting ready to teach it. It lets you know where you're going. Now let's jump to the student activity pages for just one minute. Page 11 of every week is a similar thing. It's an introduction that you can read aloud to your students. It's in prose. It's meant to be read aloud to them at the beginning of the week to sort of give them an introduction as to what they're going to be studying this week. So you can gather your children around the kitchen table and you can have a planning time, which is what I always used to do with my kids, where you parse out the books and the assignments for the week. And a great thing to do is to read this aloud during that time. Okay, now coming back to the reading assignment charts, let's look at these for a minute. This is page four and this is page five. You could have them as... Um, facing in the view and if you want to I'm going to do that for a minute because I want to talk about both pages and so I'm going to make this smaller um, and go up a little bit so that you can see this okay um, and let's actually make this a little smaller as well so that we can really see these things well this is the primary resource page and the primary resources if you want to is all you need between these two pages, we're offering a combination between very directed studies and very loose open studies. Remember I told you that I wanted moms to be able to use the books on their shelves, but a lot of times those books are out of print. I also wanted to use whole books, but make sure that they were always in print if I listed them. This primary page lists all the books that are in print, and we go to great lengths to make sure that your DE copy is always caught up to the books that are in print and that all the pages of your curriculum relate to these books that are in print. And these books that are in print are enough, are plenty for you to fill a week's work for your students. These alternate reading assignments include textbooks over here. Remember I mentioned that for some children textbooks are useful and it's also alternate resources for the week. These are books that typically are out of print. A lot of them are old favorites. A lot of them you might have on your shelf. You can use all of these books practically interchangeably for these two levels for the grammar and the for the two grammar levels, lower and upper grammar. However, when you get into these two levels, the dialectic and rhetoric level, be aware that in the student activity pages, when we ask questions, we stick to these resources for asking the history questions. And the literature pages are going to be on these resources that are listed here. If you jump over to here for literature or if you jump over to here for history, just be aware that some of the questions that we ask may not be answered and so in, in the resources. And so you might have to supply the answers from the teacher's notes 
for your students. But that's not insurmountable. So if you're trying to save money by use the books on your shelves, go right ahead. That's one way that you can customize it to your own students' needs. Another way is to understand that the history in depth um, is in depth and is extra reading. Your students can read just the core and get uh, the pith of the week's reading. However, like I said, these two are important if you're going to answer the dialectic and, and uh, rhetoric accountability and thinking questions. Everything below this line, well, every, these three topics, the history, the literature, and the writing, which is in a different section, are really core in terms of credits. This is government, and it is not core. You know what, let me go ahead and increase the size on this so that you can see it better. Okay, here we go. This is a government elective. It is not core. In this case, we're studying Justinian's Code, which forms the basis for all um, Western law. And so it was very important to the development of Western law. But if your student isn't doing government or isn't this age, you don't have to do it. Here's a read aloud. You don't have to read aloud to your children, but the feedback that we got was that many people enjoy reading aloud. So we found read alouds that would be interesting to the lower, upper grammar, and dialectic levels. So this is a reading aloud that will interest all of your children. Perhaps your husband would like to do this read aloud. Again, if it doesn't serve you, just ignore it. Um, the this is the arts activity. This row is important because hands-on activities are how those tactile learners learn. And if you buy or borrow these books, you can let these students go on independent projects because the books are very detailed in explaining exactly how to do projects. There are some weeks in which we put in our own projects, and so we give detailed instructions in the student activity pages. But a lot of times we just simply list, make a mobile, and it'll be in that resource that we've um, listed in the reading assignment charts for that week. And then the church history is also an elective, um, though we think a pretty important one. We think that all Christian students should understand what God has been doing in his church since he founded it in the times of Jesus. So starting in unit four of year one, we end our Bible survey and we start up with our church history survey that goes for the rest of the three remaining year plans. And then this is the philosophy elective. It's the history of philosophy. What have non-Christian philosophers said over the years and what is their um, view of truth? That's what this philosophy elective does. Again, elective, 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 and elective. These are not essentials um, for your students. However, they enrich their world and also can be very important, especially the governor elective for fulfilling high school requirements for competitive schools. Okay, dropping down, um, the next thing that you see in the year plan is this weekly overview. And again, it's a two-page spread, but I'm going to stay um, locked into this to this aspect of it. This is the, the two pages that are here. And uh, basically, what this does is it gives you the week at a glance. And it was written to your student, again, fostering that independence that we talked about earlier. So here are the threads that were in your thread section for the teacher restated and redone um, to the student. So the short, longer, longer, and longer as you get older. Again, we've got the learning levels down here. And again, when you have combined squares like this, it applies to both the dialectic and the rhetoric. We've got people here. You don't have to use the people at all. They're here for your use if you want them. They list the important people who appear in the week's study. You can use them for introduction, you can use them for review, or you can leave them alone altogether. Same for the vocabulary words. These are newish words that are going to appear in your students' reading this week. You can use them for introduction, you can use them for review, or you can just leave them alone. It's up to you. Timeline dates are provided so that your older student, your dialectic and rhetoric, can do one four-year timeline. So if your dialectic starts it, he'll probably finish it in his first or second rhetoric year. If you're new to tapestry with rhetoric, he might do it during the four years of high school for his first rotation. You can start it anywhere. You can start it with year two or three if that's where you start with tapestry, and then you just come full circle in four years. And basically this helps with horizontal, we call them connections, meaning connections that happen across history, such as the fact that Buddha and Confucius were alive on the earth at the same basic time things like that that you don't see when you're studying the different um, areas of the world um, over the course of time through your history studies. And then um, this uh, second page of the weekly overview charts lists in summary the activities, the possible activities. If you've looked over the student activity pages and you've seen, for instance, that 
Um, there's an opportunity for your student, your your uh, little lower grammar student, to make, or let's take your upper grammar student. Let's say there's a um, you can he can create model icons, he can paint or color a picture of a Christian saint, or he can make a book of days. Go into your student activity pages, learn the details of this, and then you can just check one of these off. That's what these square bullets throughout the curriculum are for. It's so that you can check it off, and if you have DE, you can print a copy of this, or if you have a family binder, you can just check it off on page protectors, and then your students know which assignments you'd like them to do. So this is where you just, at a glance, can make choices for which um, projects your student might want to do. This we're going to kind of leave alone right now down here. This is the um, group activities. Unless you have a co-op, you probably won't be using this row at all. And then this here is, again, a summary of your geography assignments that are fleshed out in the student activity pages. And again, you can use the square bullets to just check this off. And here's your customizing work for, uh, for your whole week done in an at-a-glance format. So that's what that does. Now, uh, writing assignments, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here. Basically, um, let me take the view back into page layout into single page. Uh, basically, these just go from levels 1 through 4 on this page, and then they go into levels 5 through 9 on this page, and then they go into levels, um, or I guess it's 5 through 8, and then into levels 9 through 12. And what these are is each week your student is only going to be in one level and he's going to be doing this much work. And our companion is writing aids and writing aids will instruct you in how to teach this lesson. It will give them printable talking points pages that they can stick into their notebooks and have a record of what you said in your lecture. And then as the week progresses, you're going to want to work with their writing as they need it and by the end of the week to produce a finished product and you can read more about that in the unit introduction how to get that done coming along to student activity pages this is where you get the detail that you need so here's your little lower grammar notice that down near the bottom of this page you have a circle that tells you again red that you're in the lower grammar level as well as you have headers at the top of the page that tell you that and this one in this particular week plan has just a lot of information on how to do the fine arts and activities because it's an introductory week and we're doing a mosaic project and the project is not detailed in one of the resources that we gave you. So remember I said sometimes we make up our own projects and we explain them right within the student activity pages. So this one, paint your salt map from last week, you may have started a salt map from last week and for instance you may decide that your little student doesn't need to do a mosaic this week. So you may, back at the weekly overview, you may just check off um, on page 7 that he's just going to finish actually you wouldn't check any of these off because these are the are the um, the new projects but you wouldn't check anything off here because in your mind you've decided that all he's going to do is finish off his little um, salt map that he started last week and that's going to be his whole hands-on work for this week so week by week you're just going to look and see which projects best fit your student now here's an example of how we list the projects that are from books. Here's the Days of Knights and Damsels, which is the book that we're recommending for hands-on work. And here's Make a Scroll, Learn to Write Calligraphy, Decorate Some Pretty pa Paper, Illuminations. You'll look in the table of contents and you'll see these projects. And again, you can decide whether or not he's to do them. And if he is to do them, you can go back to page 7 and you can check off any of these. Some of these are better for single students, some of these are better for groups, and so we split them between these two according to which is better. But of course, you can always go into the group assignments and assign one of those as well. And so you work your way through the student activity pages. Do you want him to do the geography? Then you would go ahead and help him to write that into his little planner. And this is his little uh, literature worksheet based on a little book called Cademan's Song. And it just takes him through synonyms and antonyms. And you do a little teaching according to the student activity pages. Um, I mean, the teacher's notes guide. According to the teacher's notes guide, you would just go through these um, words that are synonyms and antonyms for these words. And that would be his little work page based on the book. We also have, and this is week two of an entire year plan, so we have a scavenger hunt um, to learn their way around the library. Now this applies to two levels. You can see down in the corner here, if I can scroll down carefully enough, you'll see two colors. That's because it applies to lower grammar and upper grammar. It's an activity for both of them. Now here we begin um, 
to see your upper grammar activities. And if I scroll down, you'll see that this is a um, now going to be a yellow circle down at the bottom, indicating what it's for. And again, we've got some projects that are not listed in the books, and then we've got some projects that are listed in the books. And again, it's your choice which of these you'd like to assign to your child and then refer back to your weekly overview and check them off for him, whichever ones you want to use. All right, now let's see. I think we were on page 16. Yep. Okay, so we're going to scroll down here. And there's the geography work. You can use it or not use it. It's up to you. Here's his little worksheet for the Tales of King Arthur, um, which is uh, question and answer more. And he would answer it down here on this little work page. If you have print only, these are available on your Loom disk to be printed. If you have DE, you can print all pages of the curriculum. So you can print that off for him. Now we're into the dialectic level. I know because it said dialectic level. And also it's a green circle down here. And here's a large and interesting um, project that my student might want to do. But before I get to that, in history, we begin to have accountability and thinking questions. And these, if I use the primary resources on page four, these answers will be in there, the accountability questions and the thinking questions. You do need to refer to other parts of the curriculum to understand exactly how to use these. Most people most week assign them, but they may not assign them with, with having them write out um, the questions. You may not want your student to write them out. You may want them to just be able to do it orally. And these, especially thinking questions, prime the pump and help the students to begin to make connections so that you can finish helping you make those connections during your um, discussion. And now we're down to geography. Same uh, order as in the lower levels. And now this is the church history, um, which follows a textbook um, called The Church in History. Um, which we follow all the way through the dialectic level. Sorry, I lost it. There he is. The Church in History by Quiver. And um, the Church in History has questions that are asked by the book, um, or you can um, have your own. And then this is their little literature page. They're reading Aladdin and other tales of the Arab from the Arabian Nights. And this is, as you see, a little more complex page. Um, they're talking about actions, abilities, and thoughts and feelings. And they're looking at the relationships to each of these characters. And so um, that's their little work page. And then for the rhetoric level, we have more accountability and thinking questions. Again, it's up to you to decide how much. If the student is reading both of the core and the in-depth, they shouldn't have any trouble answering these questions at the high school level. Here's their geography, a little more complex than the lower levels. Here's their literature. The literature is is more challenging um, in this level, but it's very rich and very good. And Another session in our tapestry teacher's training helps you with understanding our goals for especially rhetoric literature and why it is um, in such depth. We see great value in studying classical literature and studying it in great depth. So this is the section that helps the student prepare for a discussion of their literature. And this is more of that. And then they have their church history that you can do or not do. It's an elective. And then you have government, which they can do or not do. It's an elective. And then finally, the philosophy. And that would be the end of the student activity pages. Then, if they are doing the pageant of philosophy, um, you would come along and look at the pageant of philosophy. You might want to read it through yourself. Um, it's always in uh, the form of a little playlet between Simplicio, who is a simple youth, and the philosopher of the day. So this one is about Boethius. And Simplicio and Boethius have a conversation, and then there's a little background reading, and then there's a discussion script. Okay, we're coming down the home stretch here. I'm not going to go in detail through the teacher's notes because other sessions do that, but basically you have background information, and it depends how much you have um, each week. And then you have... Um, you come to the discussion outlines. The dialectics and the rhetorics each have their own discussion outline. Note always that the italics that are in the discussion outline are our idea of what a student could answer on his own. The things that are not in italics down here are things that you're meant to lecture to your student. 
And then up here, I also want to draw your attention to this. This is helpful for preparing for your discussion. Sometimes, because the disciplines of tapestry overlap, where the church history has bearing, especially in the medieval times, on the history, the art history is important to understanding the history of the Byzantines, etc., you will need to read in the background information for other disciplines besides history before having your history discussion. So beware of those orange boxes before you start your discussion. And what you want to do is just read through this discussion, read through the background information, and just get an idea of what you yourself would like to talk about with your student. And this is where you bring to the discussion your own knowledge and your own point of view, lifestyle, everything. Rhetoric discussion outline is very similar. Um, we say first hour, second hour, because that's about what we time it for for a group discussion, usually with um, a smaller, uh, either one-on-one -on -one or a small group of maybe two-on-one. -on -one. It takes less than an hour. Um, we just allow an hour for people to talk. This um, chart is something that the students um, have been given as a suggested activities in the government elective. Um, they cover the information in even more detail. So this is the Code of Justinian, and this is what your basic history student has learned this week about the Code of Justinian. So we have the answers here, both so that you can direct your student in filling it out and so that you can use it in class. It's up to you. It's a resource you can use either way. And so we're going down now through the discussion outline for the uh, rhetorics. Now we get to the literature background information. This is on the Arabian Nights, which is obviously for the lower level students. This is on Cademan, um, which was that lower grammar book. And um, then we ha start to have the answers to those worksheets that we just saw um, in the curriculum. So each of the worksheets is going to have, you can look for the little graphics that are the same, and each worksheet has its answers here in the student activity pages. You can save time by allowing a student that you trust to go ahead and correct his own work, um, or you can correct it and find out how much he retained and fill in the blanks for him for things that he missed. And then this begins the rhetoric discussion outline. Again, if there's things that would prepare you better as a teacher, we have the orange box. And then it goes down through the class topics. Again, if it's something the student can get, it's in italics. And if it's something that you need to lecture or tell, then it's in non-italics under each question. So this is going down through the literature discussion outline for this week. And... And then we're going to get to, pretty soon, we're going to get to the geography. This is the background information for geography. Um, this will give you the whys behind the whats. Um, it sometimes gives you a map to help you out, and it also just tells you things that are answers to, to broad questions that we might ask the students when they're doing their geography work. And then there's also art background for things like frescoes and mosaics that we're talking about this week. And then here's the church history background information. Every week, all the background information is in the exact same order. So you see, we are giving you all that you'll need in terms of background information, facts, and etc. And we, what we want you to bring to the party is your unique perspective. So here's the church history discussion outline on a chapter in church history in plain language, chapter 12, and we also have them reading chapter 13 in this week, and also chapter 17. So they had a hefty assignment. And then this is the geography, more about Justinian's code. This is a full um, dis discussion outline, but of course you don't have to do the whole thing. You don't have to do any of it if you're not doing the discussions and following the government elective. And now here's the philosophy. And in the script that I showed you in the student activity pages, there were three um, statements by the philosopher that are highlighted in a blue bar. And here in the discussion outline, you discuss those three statements that are in the blue bars. And that constitutes pretty much the entire discussion. And then finally, there's the glance. The glance into next week will help you to say, it'll say some of the illustrations in Sinbad may be a bit alarming for young, tender-hearted children. Please flip through the book to determine the acceptability. If you desire for your lower grammar students to learn more about Islam, check out books on the subject at your local library. These kinds of things help you with preparing for the week ahead. A lot of times, too, we have tips for how to combine things um, in the glance as well. This week doesn't happen to have it, but a lot of times look for tips down here on how to combine resources and save money. So that's my overview of this um, of this one-week plan of Tapestry of Grace. I hope this session has been helpful to you, and I hope that you have a great day or evening. God bless.